Hak Sameach. Happy Hanukkah. Hanu what? Hanukkah. This word actually may sound weird to many, but this is a Hebrew word which means dedication. And actually, we find in the Gospel of John, it means dedication, where you see the feast of dedication as you have it up there. And uh, Hanukkah often comes at almost the same time as Christmas. This year, Hanukkah begins on Tuesday and goes on for eight days until the Wednesday after, and it covers the time of Christmas. So we'll have a double feast of lights. But is there a relation between Hanukkah and Christmas? Is there a relation between these two feasts? I want to tell you there's a strong one. These two feasts seem to be seas apart. One is seen as Christian and the other one as Jewish. But for us who believe in the Word of God, these two feasts are very connected. The story of both are in our Bible. And their respective message happens to be very similar. Historically, both these feasts bring us to a very difficult time in the history of Israel when the Jewish people were called to prepare the land they were called to prepare the temple for the first coming of the Messiah while Christmas speaks of the birth of the Messiah Hanukkah brings us about 165 years before where the people of Israel and their extraordinary opposition began to prepare Jerusalem and the temple of God where the Messiah Yeshua was to walk Hanukkah speaks of the de- dedication of the temple that was previously destroyed by the Babylonians. It is mentioned in John 10:22 to 23. There it's called the Feast of Dedication. This is what it says. It says, now it was the Feast of Hanukkah, dedication, in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. It was winter, and Jesus was there at the temple during Hanukkah. It is no accident that after... Discussing the Feast of Tabernacle in John 7, 7 to John 10, 21. John then discussed the life of the Messiah in relation to the next feast, the Feast of Hanukkah in John 10, 22 to 39. And what Jesus taught at this time is related to the message of the feast and the one preceding. Something we will see later in this study. It is always beneficial to look at the gospel in its historical or its Jewish perspective. Then it comes alive. Today, Hanukkah is a major feast in Judaism. If you live in a Jewish area or if you are near a Jewish one, in fact, we are relatively all near one in Montreal since there are about 100,000 Jews that live here. Uh, you will notice probably in the coming days many Hanukkahs on window seals and on Jewish homes. So Hanukkah is a lampstand just like we have here. And each day, Jewish families light one candle until the eighth day, until it's fully lit. See that there are nine branches. Every day of the feast, the middle one that is called the shamash, that is the servant, which is always lit, will be used to light one candle each day for eight days. Does that remind you of something? Jesus said in John 8:12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You know that these words Jesus pronounced during the preceding feast, the Feast of Tabernacle, which is very related to Hanukkah. In fact, the eight days of Hanukkah arose from the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacle. You know, at the time, in 165 BC, because they had not been able to observe the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles, because the Syrians were still in control of Jerusalem, they proceeded to observe the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles three months later. Out of that arose the concept of the eight days of Hanukkah. But in both feasts, the servant is the light of the world. You know, this tradition of lighting the candles dates back before the time of Jesus. And he himself must have followed this tradition what that was observed by most Jews, if not all the Jews at the time of Jesus. Today, modern Judaism has another teaching for the origin of the eight candles. The legend says that when Judas Maccabee, the hero of Hanukkah, reconquered Jerusalem from the Greeks, he went into the temple and found it all desecrated except for one jar of oil that was used to light the menorah that needed to be lit perpetually. So this menorah is the one that was placed in the holy place. And even though the jar contained enough oil for one day, the high priest miraculously found it full every day for eight days. And so he had enough oil for eight days. This is a very nice legend, but it came way after the facts. 
The historical books that speak of the Maccabean revolt, such as 1st and 2nd Maccabee, make no mention of such miracle. It is found only in later rabbinic tradition. So better stay with the original meaning. There the Messiah actually could be better seen as the servant, the Shamash. What then does Hanukkah represent? And what is really its relation to Christmas? Let us go in history and see what happened at Hanukkah. You know, the time surrounding the Feast of Dedication was a time of great turmoil in Israel. The Jews had just come back from Babylon. The Babylonian diaspora had just finished. Only a few of them did come back. And as we see in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, they lived under constant opposition, an opposition that should not surprise anyone since the Jewish people were then called to usher to prepare the coming of Jesus. This period is commonly called the 400 years of silence, but let me tell you that it was anything but silent, and God was very much in action. Briefly, we remember that in the book of Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar dreamt of a statue made of gold, as you see, silver, bronze, and iron mixed with clay. This dream so affected the king that he asked his magis to not only give him the interpretation of the dream, but to tell him the dream itself. He knew that it was easy to invent an interpretation, but it's completely another thing to come up with the actual dream. So this demand was unheard of before. These Magi's even confessed in Daniel 2, and this is a great confession they came up with in verse 10. They said, there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. They were right, only God can do that. And so he did reveal the dream to a Jewish captive, Daniel the prophet, who was among the Magi's of Babylon. To him was given the information. So Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was, and he gave him the interpretation. The king was so impressed that he made Daniel the chief of all the Magi's. This is an irony, by the way, because he's a prophet of God, of a Jewish prophet of God, being chief astrologer in Babylon. I want to tell you, God does have a good sense of humor. And I am sure that he had a good influence. Daniel had a good influence on the Magi's. In fact, it was some, the Magi's, some of them that came later on in Israel, in Jerusalem, and they said, where is the king of the Jews? So Daniel must have been a great evangelist at that time. He must have spoken to them about the Messiah, because the Magi actually knew from Daniel 9, the time of his coming, they knew from Balaam, actually, that the existence of the star, but how did they know he was a king? I think Daniel told them. What was Nebuchadnezzar's dream? He saw a statue symbolizing four consecutive powers that would influence the whole world until the first coming and also the second coming of the Messiah. These kingdoms were the Babylonian Empire, Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar Empire, then the Medo Persian, then the Greek, and lastly the Roman, which will re resurrect in the latter times into the kingdom of the Antichrist. This is that kingdom that is about to be form that resurrect in the world. So this dream is a panorama of the main Gentile powers until the millennium. Now, world powers between the Romans and the Antichrist are not mentioned. Why is that? Because the time of grace is a mystery. Daniel could not see it. So at the time of Hanukkah, the Greek empire was fading and the Romans were taking over. Alexander the Great divided his kingdom into four sections two of which represented Egypt and Syria. And Israel happened to be right in between. The one who led Egypt, Antiochus Epiphanes, who ruled from 175 to 165 BC, was given an ultimatum by the Roman general, Pompilius Linus, to leave Egypt or to face the Roman army. Leaving Egypt, Antiochus went north to Syria, and on his way, what did he do? He stopped by Israel. And there he turned his humiliation against the Jews. And for some reason, he decided to do away with everything that is Jewish. Now, some of the things he decreed was to forbid the Jews to read the scriptures. What's the relation? Tell me. He ordered that all the scrolls of the law to be confiscated and to be burnt. What does the Bible have to do with conquering the land of Israel? I want to tell you very much so. That was the best way to separate the Jews from their God and to make them forget that the word was soon to come in the flesh and to be in their midst. 
To make the people forget their gods was in fact the deduction of the writer of the apocryphal book, First Maccabee. Of course, we don't believe it was inspired, but there's a lot of information in there. There we read in chapter 1 that Antiochus sent letters to the Jews that they should forsake everything pertaining to God. This is what it says. It says, to the end that they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. And whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, he said he should die. While highly intelligent, Antiochus did not realize that he was not fighting the Jews, really. But he was fighting God. And knowingly, he found himself in the midst of a very fierce spiritual battle. Because the Messiah was to come on earth. Another of his attempts was to do away with the temple. He wanted to change everything in the temple. Now you're going to recognize somebody else there. You know, there's a very specific first prophecy that was given not too long before Hanukkah. It was prophesied by Malachi that actually the Messiah was to come in the second temple, the very temple of the time of Antiochus. This is in Malachi 3.1. And he says, by the way, this is before the coming of uh, uh, John the Baptist and also of Elijah. He says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his, to his temple. You know, this prophecy tells us that the Lord whom the nation seeks and whom the whole world sought for was coming to the temple in Jerusalem at his first coming. This is why so many Jewish believers were there waiting for him. Antiochus played in the hands of Satan. He tried to hinder that prophecy. But Jesus did come in the temple. And Malachi 3 is the reason why I believe Shimeon and Hannah were both at the temple waiting for the Messiah. Shimeon was led by the Spirit. It is always so easy to be led by the Spirit when we know the Word of God. And it seems that Anna did not want to miss even one minute of it all. It says in Luke 2.37, it says that this woman did not depart from the temple at all. But she served with fasting and prayers day and night. She never departed from the temple because she knew perhaps this prophecy, but she knew that the Messiah was to go to come there. You see how, how important the word of God was for these people. Now, what if you were there as a believer at the time of Antiochus, and this man tells you you're not allowed to read your scriptures. You're not allowed to exercise your belief. What would you do? I want to tell you where sin abounds. What, I, what else abounds? Grace. God, I want to tell you, did not leave the believers of the time to themselves. In order to prepare them, saying that the situation was to cause them much disturbance. He gave them some of the most powerful prophecies we can find in the Bible. So powerful that even today many say that these prophecies were written after the facts. These do not believe in the power of the word or in the power of God's grace. What are these prophecies that God gave the Jews at the time of Antiochus? These are found in an isolated chapter in the Bible. A chapter we often do not read. This chapter is Daniel chapter 8. You can go there if you want. We're going to see a few passages. You know, some commentators have even deemed this chapter as the preacher's nightmare. Because they say it is so difficult to preach from it. However, there is something truly wonderful in this chapter. But what Daniel 8, I'm going to tell you, was to the people of the time, the book of Revelation would be to the people of the tribulation time, as it is for us to this somehow. Let's briefly look at it. First, in order to appreciate this chapter, we must first realize that Daniel 8 marks an important point in the book of Daniel. Looking at the book in general, we find that from chapter 1, that chapter 1 is written in Hebrew. But from chapter 2 to 7, Daniel is written in Aramaic. Why? Because since the prophecy contained in this section speaks of Gentiles and pious, it is then written in the language of the Gentiles of the time, Aramaic. By the way, the Talmud is also written in the language of the Gentiles, which is Aramaic. But once you reach chapter 8, it reverts back to the Hebrew language because the prophecies of this chapter concerns Israel directly. 
And this aims at the event surrounding Hanukkah. And it does precede Jan- Daniel 9, 24 to 27, which speaks of the date of the first coming of Jesus. Now first no- notice that in verse 2, that Daniel was in a particular city to receive this prophecy. That's relevant. What is that city? It's Sushan. While the previous prophecies were given from Babylon, this one is from Sushan. What is so special about this city? This is the very city where the Jews began their return to Israel in order to build a temple in preparation from the Messiah, for the Messiah. This is the city where Esther and Mordechai were. And especially where Nehemiah and Ezra began their ascent to Jerusalem. These along with Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi lived during the time, the period of time preceding Hanukkah and the first coming. This prophecy of Daniel 8 encouraged them so much in the face of persecution. What then is this prophecy? Without going into the details, what is extraordinary about it is that Daniel gives the actual name of two kingdoms that were unknown at the time, way before they were known of the people, From verse 1 to verse 8 of Daniel 8, we have the first part of the vision. Here Daniel sees a fierce ram who had two long horns. One was longer than the other. Of this animal, he says, at the end of verse 4, he says, No animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver him from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And suddenly another animal... A male goat appears, one that is even fiercer. This is in verse 8. We read that this he goat moved with rage against him, against the ram, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. How can we preach on this, right? You know, this vision was so disturbing, was so incomprehensible to Daniel that God sent Gabriel, the angel, to comfort and explain the vision to Daniel and to us. By the way, this is the same Gabriel that later came to announce to Mary the the birth of the Messiah. And it is here that we see one of the clearest prophecies concerning the future. And you would think that the clarity of this prophecy will have brought many people to see the inspiration of the scriptures. On the contrary, they're still accusing us of manipulating the word of God and saying that this prophecy was written after the facts. Gabriel gives us the identification of the first animal. This we see in verse 20. It says, the ram which you saw having two horns, these, they are the kings of Persia and Media. At the height of the Babylonian Empire, Daniel is told that another kingdom, the Medo-Persian, will come and destroy the Babylonian Empire. It is as if I tell you that Quebec will invade the United States in the near future. At the time, the Persians and the Medes were as Quebec is to the United States. That is military and significant, right? Who would have believed this? Daniel knew from Nebuchadnezzar's dream that another kingdom was to come. Now he notes his name. The Medo Persian, one that is explained, that, uh, by the way, why the Rams has two horns. It was Medo and the Persians, two kingdoms together. This piece of information gave the believers of the time knowledge of the direction of their present. They knew something which would be impossible to know apart from the scriptures, just like today, right? If you read the scriptures, if you read the end time prophecies, you would know the direction of our future, where it's going to. As God said in Amos 3, 7, very important verse, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secret to His servant, the prophets. And this is true even now. But the next prophecy is even more powerful. And it is really here that the Bible critics really cry foul. They just cannot understand and believe the power behind the word of God. See that Gabriel now identifies the name of the third kingdom. He goes even much further and gives Daniel and the Jews of the time a complete history of the third kingdom even before it existed. Look at verse 21, 22. It says, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. And for the broken horn 
and the four that stood up in its faith, place. Four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. Greece, I want to tell you, at the time of the prophecy, consisted of a number of independent villages and was no threat at all. As if I tell you that the people of NDG here, area of Montreal, will invade the whole world. Would you believe this? It was only the remnant of Israel that believed that Greek people were to rise, and they did, and they were not surprised, and they knew where their world was going. And we understand now why the goat had four horns. They represent the four divisions of the Greek Empire after the death of Alexander the Great, situation under which the events of Hanukkah happened. Antiochus Epiphanes was heading one of them. And Daniel prophecies goes much further than the events of the time. Because you know that Antiochus is a type of the Antichrist. Because both of them share the same prophecies. We know that, the, that, that Antiochus went as far as offering a pig on the altar. So it rendered it and holy for Jewish people. He went to the whole, into the Holy of Holies, so in the temple, and set up a statue of a Greek god. This is what we call what Jesus called what Daniel calls the abomination of desolation. And its real fulfillment will be when the Antichrist will enter the temple. And as Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, he says, He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. This is yet future. The temple is yet to be rebuilt. This prophecy has not happened yet because it would be Jesus who comes and takes away this Antichrist. So Antiochus, by the way, full name was Antiochus Epiphanes. You know what Epiphanes means in Greek? It means God manifest, God incarnate. He thought himself as the Messiah, perhaps. You know, the Jews in Israel called them Antiochus Epimanes, which means Antiochus the madman. Again, while Antiochus was driven by madness and hatred, I don't believe that he knew all the implications of all that he was doing. He was just a pawn in the hands of the devil, one just like Haman, one just like Hitler. To this version of this pawn is a man called Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who overtly and publicly proclaims the annihilation of Israel. He's not shy. This man, it seems, is ready to sacrifice all the people of Iran to satisfy his hatred of the Jews. As Antiochus, little does he realize that he is taking on to fight the God of the Bible. And it is because of this oppression that God raised the man called Judas Maccabee. You know what Maccabee means in Hebrew? The hammer. I believe that he was chosen by God. And I believe that he gave him so much power that he was, he actually fought against the Syrian army and won over them. But what really was behind Hanukkah? You know, looking at the biblical context, the events surrounding Hanukkah were but one more example of the continuous attempt to prevent the coming of the seed of the woman. That is the Messiah himself. And this is something we see throughout all the scriptures, even from the very beginning. You know, the first attempt is seen as early as Abraham, from whom the Jews were to come. At some point in his life, the men of faith lacked faith and left the land of Israel because of a famine. And ended up in the land of Gerar, where King Abimelech was ruling. The account concentrated, by the way, in one point, if you read it. That of the desire of the king to take Sarah for himself because it says she was very beautiful. But it was through her that the Messiah was to come. As the king was about to take hold of her, God intervened. See what he says to him. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and he said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man if you touch that woman. Do not touch this woman because this is where Jesus was to come. This, I want to tell you, set a precedent of the many attempts that followed in the scriptures for the next 4,000 years to today. Not long after Abraham, Isaac lacked faith as well. And the same point as his father and God intervened to protect Rebekah. 
We have seen how God protected the Jewish males when Pharaoh attempted to draw all the new male born. But it did not work. It was his army at the end who drawn and Israel grew up to be a nation. The kings of Judah. If you read the scriptures, if you read the history of Israel, you're going to notice that the kings of Judah were in constant danger of annihilation. They wanted to kill them. Non-stop. Because it was from them that the Messiah was to come. Beginning with David. Right after he was anointed as eventual king of Israel by Samuel, Saul, the king of the time, began his relentless pursuit to kill David. By the way, this is that time when David began to write these messianic prophecies, just like Psalm 22, they pierced my hand and my feet. He was under so much pressure because they wanted to kill him, that God used them in his suffering to utter these great words of the prophecies. And up to the Messiah, whose life was also in constant danger of being annihilated. First with Herod. He wanted to kill him while he was a baby. We see it in the account of Christmas. And during the time of the ministry, I don't know if you noticed, that his life was always in danger as Satan tried again and again to stop Jesus from going on the cross. In John 5.16, it says, For this reason the Judeans persecuted Jesus because they wanted to kill him. Why did they want to kill him? He had no army. He just wanted to talk, to speak, to teach. They try again to discourage him or to send him away. In John 7.1, it says again, They wanted, they sought to kill the Messiah. The final attempt, I believe, was in the Garden of Gethsemane where was waged the fiercest spiritual battle of all age. But Yeshua did go on the cross and died for all of us, for all those who confess Him as their personal Savior. Today it is not much different because all these attempts have no more, are no more concentrated on one tribe or one individual, but is again concentrated on all of Israel. You know why. You know, Jesus said something that helps us to see this battle had not yet finished. This will help us to understand the rise of anti-Semitism in the world because it will rise again and again. In Matthew 23, 39, before going to the cross, Jesus says, For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes into the name of the Lord. This verse sheds light on today's anti-Semitism in the world because one more time the coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, is linked with Israel. It is linked with her confession. And indeed, his coming is directly related to Israel's confession with this great verse that we've seen so many times, Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the grace of the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look upon me whom they have the curve, they have pierced with a sharp object, and they will mourn of, of for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for firstborn. This is true confession. So Jesus will not come back to earth until the Jews and the Jewish leaders, the believing remnant of Israel, ask him to come back. For just as it was the Jewish leaders who led the nations to rejection of the Messiah, they are the ones who must also lead the nation of Israel in the acceptance of the Messiah. This is why Satan is and will be after Israel and all Jews, especially towards the end. Now, practically, Hanukkah stands for something that touches us all. It stands as a continuing reminder of God's faithfulness towards those that are His. Hanukkah is not only for the Jews, no more than the Old Testament and even the history of Israel only belongs to the Jews. Hanukkah speaks louder to all who believe in Jesus, Jews and Gentiles. And as we have seen before, the Feast of Hanukkah is mentioned in the Gospel of John. And it was not put there just like that. There's a strategic place right there. The place where it is mentioned is very, very significant. Nothing, I want to tell you, in the world is put amiss. So let's see what Hanukkah is doing in John 10. You know, it was during the Feast of Hanukkah 2,000 years ago that Jesus went to the temple. And it is during this time that he utters some great words that become even more significant when you put it in the context of Hanukkah. While few Gentile Christians know about the Feast of Israel, Jesus, I want to tell you, did celebrate them all. And many 
of the things he did and said he did under one or the other Jewish feasts. Jesus did celebrate the feast of Passover. We saw it in John 2 and many other places. He celebrated Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacle in John 10 and so on. And Hanukkah is strategically placed here in John 10. The message that Jesus brings in there is really the same as the one of Hanukkah. You know, both John 10 and Hanukkah speak so strongly about God's protection of his own. Jesus took the opportunity of the Feast of Dedication to stress his love and protection for his own, and is framed by Yeshua's message of assurance and protection and of eternal security for the believer. Verses 1 to 21 come after the healing of the, born, of the man born blind. Do you remember that story? Never in history was a man born blind healed. Jesus did it. Even the Gospel of John. They were surprised that he could do something like this. Because that was a messianic miracle. Christ the true shepherd had come through the appointed door it says. That is the prophesied messianic line. He wasn't a thief just like the religious leaders as he calls them. And in section in verse 22 we have the mention of Hanukkah. Then in the section 22 to 41 Jesus speaks of the unity of the Godhead in protecting you, in protecting the believer. This is where we read one of the most beautiful passages in the scriptures. This is John 10, 27 to 30. This is what it says. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hands. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You know, these words from our Messiah are of a great source of faith and comfort for us. We are the sheep and Yeshua is our shepherd. And the choice of this animal to symbolically represent the believer is crucial. Do remember that for one thing, sheep have no means of defense. They are defenseless. They cannot run. They cannot flock together. But their numbers do not increase their strength. Really, their own safety is in the power and carefulness of the shepherd. This is why we are called the sheep, and he's the shepherd. Remember again, Philip Keller in his book, The Shepherds Looks at Psalm 23. There are four requirements, actually. Do you remember these four requirements that your sheep needs? in order to kind of relax. These are the same requirements we need. First, due to their timidity, they must be free from all fear. He takes our fear. He cleanses us of our fear. Next, because of their sociability, they must be free from friction with others of their kind. This is why we have to put on Christ. We have to be like Christ. We have to speak like He speaks, think like He thinks. Third, they must be free from flies or parasites if they are to relax. And lastly, they will not lie down unless free from hunger. And it's only the shepherd that can provide all these things to them. Again, this is what we call the sheep. And so we are all the sheep gone astray. And we all need our shepherd. These four things can only be achieved through the Messiah. And here Jesus speaks so strongly about his desire to protect us and to feed us. Here in verse 30 he says, I and the Father are one. He did not say this only to prove his unity, because he did prove his unity. It's quite clear from the beginning that Jesus is God. He said that in order to show us that him and the Father, the whole Trinity is engaged in keeping us together. That he and the Father are one in protecting each and every believer. God the Father and God the Son are one in that they both assure us of eternal destiny with them. You are not only in God's hands. You have two hands, right? You are also in God the Father's hands. There we see God's faithfulness assuring us that every one of his promises will come to pass, right? We need that. Because we forget. And this is what Hanukkah is about. And this is what Christmas is about. Concerning the nation of Israel. Amidst the persecution and tribulation, God will always be there to protect His own. 
Will it be the remnant of Israel or the remnant of the church? He will be there as he will be for us. You know, one of the ways to better see, to better grasp God's love for us is to see a mother's love for her child. You know, this motherly uh, instinct reflects God's love for us. You know, I read a true story about the mother's love for her child. It was a Northwest Airlines Flight 225 that crashed just before takeoff from, uh, after takeoff from Detroit on August 16, 1987. It killed 155 people and only one person survived. It was Cecilia. She was four. She was from Temple, Arizona. When rescuers found Cecilia, they did not believe she had been on the plane. They thought that she had been a passenger in one of the cars on the highway into which the airline crashed. But when the passenger's list was checked, there was Cecilia's name. Cecilia survived because as the plane was falling, Cecilia's mother, Paula Chaikan, unbuckled her own seat belt, got down on her knees in front of her daughter, wrapped her arms and body around Cecilia, and will not let her go, noting nothing that is could separate that child from her mother's love. Neither tragedy, nor fall, nor flame that follow. Such is the love of our Father to us. Somehow this mother did the utmost. She could not do more than that. She kneeled down in front of her daughter. She wrapped her arms around her and she prayed to God. And God listened. He did the rest. That Cecilia was the only one that survived. This, I believe, is a miracle. This is the power of love and the power of prayer. Now, how do the Jews celebrate this feast today? Now, besides eating a lot, especially latkes, which are shallow fried pancakes and grated potatoes, which we'll have in our Hanukkah party on Christmas Day, which is Hanukkah Christmas party. Besides this, this it became accustomed to give each other gifts, just like at Christmas. Some give what they call Hanukkah gelt. Gelt is a Yiddish word for money. This custom is to give small sum of, uh, sum of monies to children. The other thing Jews do at Hanukkah is to play the dreidel. Now, what's a dreidel? It's interesting, by the way. It's a four-sided spinning top with the Hebrew letters on each side. And as you have on the screen, it involves spinning the dreidel and betting on which Hebrew letter will be showing when the dreidel stops spinning. Now, children usually play for chocolate coins covered uh, with gold. So, dreidel is a Yiddish word that comes from the German word drehen, which means to turn. And the origin of the dreidel is interesting. Apparently, a game similar to the dreidel was popular during the rule of Antiochus. We have seen that during this period, Antiochus Epiphanes did forbid the Jews to read their Bibles. But that did not stop them. And they kept on studying their Bibles secretly. So when they gathered to study, they would bring a top with them. If soldiers appear, they would quickly hide what they were studying and pretend to be playing a, a gambling game with a top, resembling the dreidel. This is how this game came to us, and the letters of the dreidel also mean something. Those letters are Nun, Gimel, He, and Shin, left to right, right? Which stands for the Hebrew phrase, Nez Gadol Hayacham. This phrase means a great miracle happened there in Israel. After that, the state of Israel was founded in 1948. The Hebrew letters were changed. And they became Nun, Gimel, He, Pe, which stands in the Hebrew phrase, Nez Gadol Hayapod. A great miracle happened here. You know, this feast is here to remind us of the great miracle of God's grace towards his elect. So for the Jews, Hanukkah then is a significant celebration. It stands as a continuing reminder of God's faithfulness in delivering his people from their oppressor. This feast points to a God that is always on the lookout for his people. As God said in Zechariah 2.8, For he who touches Israel touches the apple of my eyes. He is the God who says in Jeremiah 33 that if you can break his covenant with day, and his covenant with night, so that there will be no day or night. Then he says, my covenant with Israel, with David, will be broken, which is impossible. Let's bow our head in prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, grateful to have these feasts.
to remind us of what the Messiah has done for us and to remind us of the great future that awaits us. Heavenly Father, I pray in the feast of Hanukkah, I pray for the Jewish community here in Montreal, that uh, many will be attracted to you through your word, through the reading of the many passages in the scriptures in the synagogue. Many will see the hand of Yeshua, will see your hand. Lord, bless each and every one His here that is. Grant us, Lord, wisdom and open the eyes of our understanding that we may grasp this beautiful truth of the death and resurrection of your Son and know that we have a living Savior always looking for our welfare. In His glorious name we pray. Amen.